Well, kia ora koutou katoa, no mai haere mai ki te manatū hauora. Nice to see you all again up the road. Uh, I know some of your colleagues are unwell at home, wishing them all the best. Uh, it's going around, so I hear. Now, I'm joined here today by Dr Samantha Merton, who's the chair, or actually the president of the College of uh, the Royal New Zealand College of General Practitioners. She's going to tag team with me and give a bit of an update on uh, what she and her colleagues are seeing in general practice primary care at the moment, and will both be available to answer questions. So welcome, Sam. Thanks for making yourself available. So first, to just an update on the latest situation. Today, we're reporting 21,015 new community cases of COVID-19. Of those, 845, uh, sorry, not of those, but at the moment we have 845 people in hospital and of those 16 are in intensive care or high dependency units. And our total number of active cases is 208,625 across the Motu. So since the 23rd of February, so roughly the last couple of weeks, about 87% of our reported cases have been diagnosed through use of rapid antigen tests. 4% are rapid antigen tests with a confirmatory uh, PCR test and the remaining 9% have been diagnosed with PCR tests. The vast majority of results in recent days are rapid antigen tests, and so of today's cases, 97% have been diagnosed with a rapid antigen test. Uh, today in the northern region, we're seeing a similar number of hospitalizations as we've seen in the last couple of days uh, at 587 suggesting perhaps the numbers are levelling off there, but my colleague Dr Andrew Old, uh, who is the Chief Clinical Officer for the Northern Region Health Coordination Centre, will provide an update in Auckland tomorrow, and we'll be able to go into that in more detail. An update on our whole genome sequencing. <clears throat> Nationally, our data since the beginning of the year, 1st of January, shows that 21% of people hospitalised who had their um, genome sequenced were, had the Delta variant, and 79% were Omicron variant, reflecting the fact that most of our cases in hospital through January were Delta. By comparison, of hospitalised patients who had samples received at ESR and uh, whole genome sequencing in the last four weeks, none had the Delta variant. Uh, the Delta variant, in fact, was last detected in any community sample that was sequenced in mid-February, that was the 15th of February. And ESR, ESR's latest report from this morning shows that of the most recent 47 hospitalised cases where there was sequencing done, they were all Omicron, and of those, 25 were the BA1 subvariant and 22 the BA2 subvariant. And if you look at the, um, the pattern of all sequencing of all cases in the community, we've seen a growth in the proportion that are that BA2 variant. It's now about two thirds of the cases that have been sequenced in the last week or so. So, so saying, although we haven't got any of our recent hospital admissions with the Delta variant, we do know Delta is still out there in the community. And for example, uh, at least 38 uh, cases in the week ending 5th of March were epidemiologically linked to the Delta outbreak just that none of those were sequenced. Uh, one of the no challenges I know parents have been having is reporting rapid antigen test results for their children or for other dependents uh, online. So I want to acknowledge uh, those who have been trying hard, perhaps ringing the 0800 number and experiencing delays. We are, we are aware there was a temporary issue on Tuesday this week where some callers um, felt that uh, had, that had a problem with registering their cell phones for callbacks and weren't receiving that callback. We've increased capacity in the 0800 system, so that uh, phone number now has increased capacity, that's 0800 222 478. But what I can say is also from tomorrow, parents and caregivers will be able to report test results for children 12 and under and other family members through my COVID record as well. So we've increased capacity on the phone line and they will be able to do it online from tomorrow. Once again, and reflecting back on the fact that 97% of our cases today are from people having logged their positive rapid antigen test, I want to thank everyone who is doing so and it really does help us understand the extent of the outbreak and the pattern across the country. 
Uh, but at this point, I want to hand over to uh, Dr. Merton to give us an update from primary care. Kia ora. Kia ora, thank you, Ashley. So, in general practice and across anything in primary care, you can imagine that there's been a massive change in the volume of work, and um, it's been quite substantial. The college put out a survey to all its practices, and we had 478 responses of the 1,000 practices that are across the country. And 30% um, of them were looking after more, um, more than 20 patients a week ago, and 80% of them are looking after more than 20 patients now. So in my practice, in the last two weeks, I've gone from one patient to 57 patients the following week to 127 the week following that. So it has put a huge amount of work on general practice. I think when you think about the fact that there are 20,000 people who have got COVID every day and in, across the country 50,000 consultations normally happen every day, that's a 50% increase in workload if we had to deal with every one of those 20,000 that came through. So we recognise that the people who are physically generally well have been um, fully vaccinated and boosted, will have a very mild illness, will be able to manage it at home and it will be like the normal flu. And if you need to be in touch with your general practice, usually it will be if things, other things are going on for you or you do need some care. So just make sure that um, you've got what you need at home. If there's 208,625 in the country, in the community, um, then that means there's a lot of work for us if everyone was calling general practice. So health lines are also available. My colleagues want me to remind everyone that we are working really hard, doing our best for our patients. And although we are prepared and have done the best that we could do for when the outbreak occurred, it's still going to be a little bit messy for the next couple of weeks. And that's just because people will want care, but there are other people who really need care and are quite vulnerable. So GPs across the motor will be, co will be concentrating on those people who are vulnerable and need the most care, and will be contacting them if they need to. There's also issues around isolation and needing monarchy support, and so sometimes people will seek that out through their general practice, and that's okay, but it's still another bit of the work that we end up doing. The other thing that we've found is that across the country, people are stressed. People are stressed about having COVID, about being isolated, about not being able to go out, about having family members who might be sick. And the work, the practices are also under pressure to deliver as much care as they can. And so that stress can often end up with a lot of anxiety and therefore people's emotions might flare, um, to put it politely. So um, my colleagues have suggested that people be kind um, to their practices, especially the administration and reception staff who bear the brunt of the calls that come through and maybe saying um, your doctor will ring you back in a few hours or having to delay the care that you might expect. So please um, just have a bit of patience as patients and um, be kind to, to the staff. Um, the other thing that we want to remind everyone is being boosted, having fully vaccinated and boosted is the best thing that you can do. And also that as general practice, we are as open as we can be for providing service and don't delay or defer your care because we have found previously when there was a lockdown two years ago that after a couple of weeks we'd start to see people coming back in who had left things, let things ride for a while. And please don't let things ride. Please be in touch with your general practice if you need to because that's what we're there for, even though we might be a little bit under pressure. Thanks very much, Ashley. Thanks, Sam. Uh, just a couple more things I'd like to cover first, uh, and bear with me on this. Some, I'd like to explain some changes to our reporting of COVID-related deaths. So from today, we will, we will be moving to uh, a new uh, reporting approach and a sort of dual reporting approach. So first, we will automatically report all deaths of people who die within 28 days of testing positive for COVID-19. This is the approach that's used by the UK and many other countries and is the one that we will use for our official reporting and have used for our official reporting to the World Health Organization. Within uh, those, that total number of deaths, we'll also move to uh, report those deaths within three categories. 
First of all, people for whom it is clear that COVID-19 is the cause of their death. And as of today, that number is 34. The second group is people who had or were subsequently found to have COVID-19 when they died, but their cause of death was clearly not COVID-19, so they died of another cause. And as of today, the confirmed number in that group is two. Uh, then there's another group, which is the largest, which is those whose cause of death is still under investigation. And many of those will be uh, with the coroner to determine the cause of death. Uh, but we, but we, we know for sure they had COVID-19 when they died. It's just not clear whether that was the cause of their death or they happened to have COVID-19. And as of today, that number is 48. Now, if you are quick with maths, you will have noted that total is 83, which is larger than the total 81 that is the number of all people who have died within the last uh, 28 days of having had a COVID diagnosis. So over the course of the pandemic to date, we have publicly announced those 83 deaths. In the past, our approach to announcing the deaths has not always matched up with that new definition, which is the everyone who has died within 28 days of a COVID diagnosis. But from now, we will be reporting both numbers. We've also done some reconciliation of our numbers. And over the last uh, two weeks, there have been an additional nine deaths that are recorded in our deaths database of people who have died within 28 days of a COVID diagnosis, but those hadn't to date been publicly announced. Now, the main reason for this is these are people who might, for example, have died in an age residential care facility, a GP might have certified the cause of death, but it wasn't notified necessarily to our public health unit and notified through our old system. So, uh, I want to just confirm that our total number of COVID related deaths to date then, and I will just re recap on this because there are quite a few numbers here, uh, now sits at 91. And this is when we add in these additional deaths that have occurred in the last fortnight, including one just yesterday at North Shore Hospital that we are capturing from our deaths database. Of course, each one of these deaths represents a person and a whānau and community that is grieving. So I want to just acknowledge that and pass on my condolences to those who have lost loved ones, and in particular in this last uh, period of weeks. So our total deaths announced now that we believe are COVID related is 91. We will, up, we will provide an update on that number as there are new deaths recorded on our website. And we will also uh, break that down into those three categories, those who we know died with COVID, those who died from another cause but happened to have COVID incidentally, and those whose deaths remain under investigation. I do want to emphasise that New Zealand's total number of deaths remains very low by international comparison and our death rates. And furthermore, and this is important, New Zealand has a very low case fatality rate internationally, which means that people who get COVID here are getting the right care they need and are being well looked after, whether that's care in the community, in general practice, or through other community providers, or whether they require hospital level care, including intensive care. Finally, I want to finish with an acknowledgement uh, and acknowledge our health work across the uh, our health workforce across the Motu who are just uh, responding extremely well to this rapid increase in workload that Sam has outlined. I'd particularly like to give a special shout out today to the extra effort that our home carers are putting in for disabled Fano, those who require home and community support services, and and for those people who receive those services, who often because at the moment their usual carer might be unwell they have been cared for by someone different and just want to thank and acknowledge that. Uh, we can all of course continue to play our part by doing the basics well, hand hygiene, wearing a mask to protect yourself and others, physically distance and please if you are unwell or if you're uh, meant to be isolating as a contact of a case do stay at home. Uh, thanks very much again, and we're now open to questions. Dr Glenfrew, how many of those hospitalisations today are actually there because of COVID rather than other illnesses? The vast majority, and it's, it's hard for us to put a figure on this in real time because uh, the diagnosis, um, the, the final diagnosis uh, for a person when they go into hospital is coded after they leave. Uh, we're trying to get a weekly estimate of what this might be, and it will depend. So in Auckland where they've got over 500 admissions, uh, it's very hard for them to, to know 
in real time exactly which ones are there because of COVID or those that have COVID. And I should say there's quite a high turnover. Many of these people admitted to hospital are only there for one or two nights. So uh, there, there are a lot of people coming and going, so they get the care they need and then they're off home again. Uh, overseas studies suggest that it's about three quarters of people who in, are in hospital because of COVID. But in Auckland, with high levels of circulating COVID, we'd expect probably an even higher proportion of, of people who are there for other reasons, other um, just happen to have COVID. So how come two years into a pandemic, we can't have two separate groups knowing that people have just tested at the door but have come for something else, or actually are there because of mm -hmm. COVID symptoms? Uh, just to reiterate, and this is the way every country does it, uh, the diagnosis and the reason someone is admitted to hospital is coded when they are discharged from hospital and it's a specialised process. We, but we do, we do have a picture and, and that's what we'll try and create is that picture of what the proportions are likely to be. But as I say, the more COVID there is out in the community, the more likely it is people who are turning up to hospital for other reasons, whether it's an injury or another illness, will have COVID. And by way of example, uh, at the moment, around 40% of people turning up at Middlemore's emergency department, where everyone is tested, around 40% of those people are testing positive for COVID. Some, in fact many of them, because they're seeking care for their symptoms, but others it will be found incidentally. And do Auckland hospitals have more COVID cases in them than was ever modelled or predicted? Uh, yes, we've been having a look at that and uh, Gary Jackson, uh, Dr Gary Jackson in Auckland has just provided an update on the modelling here. And uh, the, the number of cases um, in hospital is higher than the, the earlier um, modelling and projections had suggested at this point in time. Um, and just to, just to go back and reiterate uh, that many of those people are just in overnight or perhaps for two nights receiving the care they need. And again, the figure, an important figure here is those number of people in ICU or high dependency units. And in Auckland at the moment, of those over 580 admissions, only 10 are in ICU. So most people are, are, are requiring just ward level care and for a short period. And why are they so much higher than what was modelled? Is that taking you by surprise? Uh, not so much by surprise. Modelling is always a, 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 um, a good way to inform planning. It's not a prediction of the future. And so one of the good things about Dr Jackson's modelling is uh, they update it with the real figures uh, on a daily basis, so are able then to project out and see what's the likely uh, demand for both hospital services and indeed for primary care services. Dr Bloomfield, um, the number of uh, children getting vaccinated has not increased uh, very much in the last few weeks. Uh, how concerned is the Ministry that first dose vaccinations for 5 to 11 year olds mm. have stalled at just over 50%? Yes, so I think we're up to around 53% uh, now overall, and we're still seeing steady progress. We saw an initial surge in, in large numbers vaccinated in those first couple of weeks, uh, and the numbers are certainly lower on a daily basis, but what is encouraging is it is still going up, and we'd, we've got a range of initiatives in place just to make sure that all those parents who do want to have their children vaccinated are able to access it readily. Dr Bloomfield, just given on mandates, vaccine mandates, do you think that they're still justified for certain workforces given Omicron is so rampant and still infecting people who are vaccinated? Well, the mandates are in place and of course, uh, like, like all those broader public health measures, some of which are, you know, are, are quite intrusive on people's lives, a requirement to wear masks in certain settings, um, uh, the the use of vaccination certificates, COVID vaccination certificates for entering some places uh, under the red uh, settings. Um, mandates are something that are there at the moment and, and are required to be regularly reviewed and are in the process of being looked at as part of the overall package of things. What I would say is that you know, one of, the, one of the reasons New Zealand's in a good position now, even though we have a very large Omicron outbreak, is because we have high vaccination rates across our population, and including relatively high booster rates. And there's no doubt that uh, the mandates and the use of COVID vaccination certificates played, have played a role in helping us get that high vaccination rate. And the questions that, of course, it's right to be asking now is, how much longer are those mandates appropriate for? And if, and if so, for which groups of people? And that's the work we are involved in uh, supporting at the moment. Given the critical worker shortage that we've been talking about right now, would you consider allowing unvaxxed people to jump in and help ease that pressure? Well, there are a number of measures in place to uh, 
help uh, ease the pressure on critical workforces, both in health settings and in non-health settings. Uh, and those have been in place since uh, the start of the outbreak, so the critical worker exemption scheme using rapid antigen tests. The number of people for, uh, who are unvaccinated who are not able to work at the moment in those critical roles is relatively small and it's much more important that we enable those who are vaccinated to be able to return to work as soon as possible, for example, through the use of rapid antigen tests to support that. Dr Bloomfield, um, Trade Me is aware of people selling free uh, rat tests online. Do you have any concerns about this? What's your message for people doing this? Mm. And can you, as the Minister of Health, do anything about it? Well, um, clearly it shouldn't be happening. And so anyone who's on selling uh, or attempting to on sell free rapid antigen tests is abusing the system, to put it a not too fine a point on it, and they shouldn't be doing it. And I'd ask them to not do it. Uh, those rapid antigen tests are there for a purpose and they are there for people to use to, to help keep themselves and others in the community safe. Also, you talked about um, issues with you know people logging onto my COVID record and recording their rat tests. Are you confident that um, the, the people logging on and recording their rat tests is providing an accurate representation of the amount of cases out in the community at the moment? Yes, this is a good question because we don't know how many people are testing each day uh, and not necessarily recording. But we've got a bit of an indication here. We know that uh, at the moment we've got about a 40% positivity rate of rapid antigen tests being recorded in the, North, in the Auckland region, for example, and it's fairly consistent around the country. So the good thing here is there are a lot of people who are testing and recording their negative result. Uh, it's, it's not really possible to get a, to ever know exactly how many people are testing and not recording their result, but what we're intending to do here is if we assume that about the same proportion of people will, over time, will record their result, we'll look at what the trend in that positivity rate is, and that will give us an indication of whether the, um, the number of cases is going up or going down. So is there more regions, essentially, where this is easier to do, or you're seeing more of this happen, and is there more of regions around the country where this is an area of concern? Uh, I don't have any information on any regional variation, but we're going to start looking at what the positivity rate for rapid antigen test reporting is by District Health Board region, and we'll be able to report that. Just, new way. Just, on, um, just on boosters for under 18, so you got some advice from technical, technical advisor group yesterday on vaccines for vaccine boosters for under 18? So uh, yes, the advice has come through in the last week or two, and I got a formal memo about that yesterday, yes. Okay. Can you sort of say a bit about what that what it said and when the decision for boosters for under 18 might come? Well, the decision will be up to ministers, and uh, they're going to have a discussion about it uh, in the next wee while, in the next few days. Uh, broadly, the advice uh, was sh saying that, um, and this is similar to a number of other jurisdictions, the, um, the evidence from studies about the bal balance of benefits and risks of boosters in uh, people aged 12 to 17, the, is, the, it's only a limited amount of evidence. So it's very much uh, looking at what the risks and benefits might be. Overall, uh, more countries are, are making it available for 16 and 17 year olds so routinely available if they want to get it, but not for that younger 12 to 15 year old uh, group. Uh, and so that's the, the gist of the advice that we've got from our, our team of, of technical experts. The question then is um, uh, uh, the decision for ministers about making that available uh, for that group if they want to do that. One thing I would say is that Pfizer has also applied to have the vaccine approved as a booster for 16 and 17 year olds and that is going through the MedSafe process at the moment um, and will likely be a decision in the next few weeks on that. Okay, and just what I heard about the huge workload obviously um, mm. primary care is under uh, with you know, huge increase in cases. Are you sort of confident just generally that everything is working as it should be at the moment and there's no one sort of out there at home really sick that's not able to get the help they need or the care they need? Well, I'm going to make a comment and then Sam will be really well placed to, to perhaps back me up on this. That's, you know, we've set up the system to try and avoid the situation where people will fall through the cracks. So it's got a number of layers on it to, to help ensure that people don't fall through the cracks, particularly those people who uh, may, be may be vulnerable or have pre-existing conditions. As we get into the outbreak, I'm increasingly confident that the systems are working uh, and... Uh, 
the, 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 the various layers, the safety nets do come into play as they should. But Sam, I wonder if you might want to comment on that too. Yeah, I think from the workforce point of view, we, we're getting um, notifications from patients with their rapid antigen tests and making sure that people do send that through so that we do have a notification. Then um, we will filter those people and make sure that we're getting to the right people, which um, gives our workload a little bit of stability. But it's still, um, most of our practices are looking for nursing staff or, and they're not available. And so it is quite tricky to make sure that we're keeping up. I think as far as the safety nets and um, people falling through the cracks, with the systems that we have and the fact that they are now reporting all their tests, then we know everyone who might be positive and can make sure that we're feeding into making sure they're okay. Yeah. Have you um, heard any incidents of people getting angry with GPs or staff? And if so, what has some of the abuse been in fact? Yeah, so we have had um, situations um, in many practices where people have been abused, yelled at, um, things thrown at them. We have had, I know in my practice, I actually have a sign on the wall which I put on up a long time ago that says we value and respect our reception staff, we hope you do too. So the fact that we have to put a sign up like that is shows the way some people respond to the services. The other thing is that we are trying to protect our staff and the other patients in the building and so having to um, corral people at the door and ask them questions, people will tell, infrequently, but sometimes will tell us lies about what what's going on in their health and will turn up and be in a room and turn, then turn out to be COVID positive and they won't have told us they've had any symptoms. So it is actually quite a struggle and we have to put up more barriers, which makes it really hard for patients. So just on that as well, a place is essentially needing to put more security in place. Like, are any, is, is there like security guards? Or I think there are practices that have um, taken the step of putting up security guards. The practices do have also had um, door lo locks on their doors so that you can't just walk in. Um, we, I know in my practice, we've so signs everywhere that say you can, no entry, no, no mask, no entry. And um, we've worked really hard with our patients to make sure that we're doing the best that we can to serve them. We do have the option of having a lot of really good car parks and Wellington weather has been amazing for the last few weeks so it's not too bad but that's the problem that we have is where else do you provide the care if they can't come into the building. Yeah. Um, for either of you perhaps, the, uh, is it still correct to refer to the BA2 subtype as an Omicron subtype or at what point do we actually, mm -hmm. um, might you be compelled to recognise it as a different strain entirely? Well, I'm not an expert in these matters, so if uh, the people who are experts are, are clear that it is a sub-strain of Omicron, then I think that's it's reasonable to go with that. I think what is clear, and we're seeing it in New Zealand, is that the BA2 sub-variant has got a slight transmission advantage over BA1, and as, as we've seen in other countries here in New Zealand, our whole genome she sequencing is showing that it is taking over, really, as the, as the dominant sub-variant. There was um, an American epidemiologist who um, told a TV show this morning that people with boosters have a 70 to 80 percent chance of protection against infection uh, for Omicron. How does that compare to the stats that you have here for us in New Zealand? Well, uh, I'll make two comments. First of all, there's no doubt that boosters do protect provide protection against getting infected in the first place from Omicron. That was unclear early on, uh, but that is, that is definitely the, the case. There is increasing evidence of that. But it's also clear that, um, like the, the two-dose primary course, that the effectiveness of boosters wanes, and relatively quickly, in terms of protecting people from getting infected or from being infected with symptomatic illness. The protection stays high, still very high for some months against hospitalisation and death. Uh, and of course the key thing is what does that imply for our vaccination program and there's questions being raised and, the t uh, and our scientific group is looking at it about whether there may be a need for further booster doses, particularly in older people or people who are vulnerable. So that's uh, work that's in progress here at the moment. Um, and just on the new way of assessing COVID related deaths, um, does this mean that the um, deaths, that we've been uh, incorrectly reporting deaths to the World Health Organisation up till now? Uh, I would say that our approach has been more inclusive than this, the, the official approach that is taken, which is the 
anyone who's died within 28 days of a, uh, of a COVID-19 diagnosis. And the reason for that is we have some deaths we report that might not fit that definition. For example, someone who's been in hospital for an extended period of time, but the primary diagnosis and perhaps the cause of their decline and, and death was COVID-19. So that's why you'll see the official number we report to WHO with that standard definition will be lower, and it's 81 at the moment, is lower than our overall total, but we will report both publicly. Does that mean you will retrospectively, um, retrospectively assess the figures previously reported to WHO and then review them? Uh, the figure to re reported to WHO is correct. Um, the, the additional deaths that we uh, have found is by looking back just over the last couple of weeks that have been captured actually by that 28-day rule rather than having come through our other reporting um, uh, avenue through public health units that we have relied on uh, previously as well. Can you explain why we think that our hospitalisation numbers in Auckland are plateauing when there are almost 100 more than yesterday and uh, about a 10% increase on the previous high from earlier this week? Uh, my reading of the number today, and I'm not sure if I've got it right, but uh, I th I, my understanding was the number was about the same as yesterday and the number in ICU had actually dropped uh, from yesterday, but I'm happy to come back to you on that. Uh, certainly the case numbers in Auckland uh, appear to have plateaued over the last few days. We will, we will know in maybe two or three days whether that represents the fact that it may think our case numbers may have peaked in Auckland and we would expect them to peak uh, in Auckland earlier than the rest of the country because that's where the outbreak really took off first. Yeah. Can, you tell, uh, can you tell us um, of today's numbers, how many of the hospitalisations and people in ICU are Māori? Uh, sorry, not off the top of my head, although just uh, st stand by there, I may have those uh, that information here and I'll just have a quick look uh, in my report. Um, Yes, uh, so just a breakdown. Now, this is just for the northern region where we get an automatic data feed. Uh, in the northern region, the hos the, of the ho people hospitalised uh, today, 125 are Māori, 224 are non-Māori, non-Pacific, and 199 are Pacific. So we do collect those data and uh, have them available. And if, if it's helpful, we can also report those uh, on our website each day. Just on rapid antigen testing, uh, what information are you getting or seeing from overseas around the swabbing of the mouth and throat with these tests along mm. with the nose? Yes, so I um, mean this is, uh, I've been watching with interest some of the experience of people here in, in New Zealand and you will have seen um, or heard directly from friends or colleagues about people who have maybe had one or two negative tests before they get a positive test, so it's not uncommon, especially if people test early uh, in, in an illness, uh, and then some people who are swabbing both throat and nose and finding that they are returning a positive test. I've not seen anything specific uh, internationally, and of course the, the main thing is that people follow the instructions uh, of the manufacturer for that specific test. Uh, but if people are swabbing uh, both throat and nose, um, I mean that's, there's, there's nothing uh, necessarily wrong or bad about doing that. Uh, so um, I'd encourage people to follow the instructions, but certainly swabbing the nose is, is the most important. Also, just on long COVID, how much of a problem do you envision it to be, and what percentage of those who get COVID are likely to suffer from long COVID? Yes, well, there have been a number of studies on long COVID. I should say that most the ones uh, most of the ones that have been published are the the, the estimates, uh, which were around thirty to forty percent of people having some sort of long. Uh, or, or, or um, uh, ongoing symptoms were from people who had had COVID in the first part of the pandemic, so those earlier variants. What will be interesting to see and most pertinent to New Zealand is what, long, what the rate of long COVID symptoms are for people who have been infected with Omicron. We are, we, ha we are going to give a fuller update on long COVID next week in one of these um, sessions, including the survey we are doing, the follow-up study we are doing of people with long COVID symptoms, and also an update on the uh, work we're doing around clinical guidance and service provision for people with long COVID symptoms. So that will be next week's, one of well, next week's briefings. Uh, so I'll just come to the front here. Thank you. Just, just, uh, um, just uh, why the dead count on the Ministry of Health website uh, still says 65 deaths? Um, yes. 
Yes, it's still to be updated with the additional deaths that we've found through that reconciliation process. So um, from after the stand-up, uh, that will be updated to, say, 81 as the official um, within 28 day, and then we're, they're 91 with the more inclusive definition, and again, though, into those, uh, divided into those three categories. Can I direct to because we know there have been those positive cases in the early days, even if mm. people are symptomatic. Should New Zealand be switching to saliva tests? Well, we have got saliva tests, uh, but saliva tests are PCR-based tests, so they require laboratory processing, and we simply wouldn't be able to do the number of tests we are doing with um, uh, rapid antigen tests. Uh, and one of the ways to get around the lower sensitivity of rapid antigen tests, especially early on in, in Ill, uh, symptoms, is to do them repeatedly. And that's why we're providing people with more than one test so they can test, particularly if they continue to or have ongoing symptoms or if they develop symptoms. And by repeatedly, you mean daily? Uh, usually every, every two or three days is enough. Yep. Why is it that um, the majority of uh, people hospitalised in the northern region are Māori and Pacific again? And why, how concerned um, should we be that this seems to be repeating a pattern that we saw mm -hmm. last year in Delta when this were ha was happening and officials gave us assurances that steps would be taken to protect Māori and Pacific? Yes, so the high proportions of Māori and Pacific uh, being hospitalised with COVID-19 reflects the, the high case numbers in those population groups and the highest case rates are still in counties Monaco that have high Māori and Pacific populations. Um, for my part I'm happy that those people are getting the care they need whether it's in the community and through general practice and support they need or the hospital care they need and again we're seeing only small numbers of people requiring intensive care or high dependency care uh, and people being in hospital just for one or two days, getting the care they need and then being uh, able to look after themselves at home. So we would expect to see higher rates of hospitalisation amongst those uh, two groups. Uh, in, and, one, and again, one of the reasons for that is higher rates of pre-existing conditions, which means that, which are more likely to be exacerbated if they do have COVID-19. So I, I would take this as a sign that the health system is responding rather than um, any, any particular problem. Well, the, the highest number of hospitalisations yesterday was in Auckland, wasn't it? Not counties, Monaco. Uh, talking about rates, yeah, it has been at counties. What yes. specific underlying medical conditions uh, do you mean? Well, uh, the, the sort of medical conditions, actually this is a good opportunity for me to, to hand over Sam, so the <laughs> sorts of pre-existing medical conditions that uh, would be exacerbated by COVID. So the things that we are looking at, if we're going to um, contact people who we're worried about, we would be looking at people who have got asthma, who have got chronic lung disease, who have got um, congestive heart failure, so heart disease, and um, then uncontrolled diabetes, and people who have other lung conditions that may put them, make them more vulnerable. So those are the groups that we're looking at, specifically at Māori and Pacific people, and then especially our older people over 75. So there, there are a range of groups that we look through and make sure that we're keeping an eye on them. Uh, and by keeping an eye on them, what, what do you mean? Are you, so, how are you um, protecting them? Yeah, so what, I'd do, what we're doing in our practice is if we have someone who fits that criteria, then we'll be ringing them early. I've asked my patients who I am concerned about to make sure they test early so that I know as soon as I can that they are unwell. And then also um, giving them pulse oximeters, doing daily checks on them, making sure that at day five that they have the um, proper testing or reviews done, and then um, making sure that their information is also loaded into the triple CM, which is the combined platform that we can use, so that if they do need out of hours care, Healthline or the hubs can um, see what's going on for them. Many of those people are in larger whānau as well, and so therefore there's a whole mixture of other things that are going on for them. Yeah. Any final questions? Yeah, just the changes to how you report the death rate. Hmm. Yeah. Is that, was the reasoning behind that as well to offer some clarity around who is actually dying from COVID-19? Because there had been criticism in hmm. the past of, of the way you guys had reported that. Yes, so the main reason is that uh, when we've reported deaths, in, in, invariably in our media releases and or at stand-ups, they're ones that have been reported through our public health units via our EpiServe database. But with public health units not so actively involved in um, the management of cases, 
now, with that happening in a range of settings, including primary care, aged residential care and hospitals. Um, we needed to sort of supplement that with our other mortality reporting database, which is the one where, where we found these other nine cases that had, had that um, where people had died, COVID, had a COVID-related death in the last two weeks, but they hadn't been reported through our public health unit. So it was to make sure our reporting was accurate. But also, the point you raise is a good one. Uh, it's, it's important we understand whether people have died from COVID or, or with COVID, just as there's a lot of interest in hospitalisations in this regard. And we wanted to make that clear to the extent we could. As I said, though, most of the, the largest proportion of, are those that are cases still under investigation, where we know the person had COVID, but it's not clear whether COVID caused their death or they just happened to be COVID positive at the time they died from another cause. What we're trying to do is be as inclusive as possible and also provide as much information as possible. Any final questions? Regarding the drop in self-isolation period from 10 days to 7 mm. days, um, we've had uh, some experts calling for like a test to release scheme where uh, I think it was one in six people might be infectious beyond the 7 days. So mm. the a test on the day six and seven would allow us to uh, find people who might still be infectious beyond that period. Uh, can we get some comment on that? Yes, so we've, right through the pandemic, uh, never used uh, test as a criteria in, a criterion for releasing someone who we know is a case, so whether it was a PCR test or any sort of test. Um, what we know is that people who are cases the vast majority of them will no longer be infectious after seven days. And a test per se is not a good discriminator of whether someone is infectious or not. Um, the best discriminator is actually whether someone has ongoing symptoms. So whilst we have reduced the period of for case isolation from 10 down to seven days, if someone has ongoing symptoms, runny nose or coughing, then they shouldn't be, they should remain away from, uh, from work and from others uh, in other settings as well. But certainly a test is not very helpful at all in terms of determining whether someone remains infectious uh, seven days into their illness. All right, thanks very much. Appreciate you coming up.